and uh, SparkNet from um, Berkeley, from AmpLab. So you have lots of options for doing uh, <coughs> deep learning on Spark, and uh, I, I guess it's easy to see why, because uh, Spark can be used as a, as a general processing network, can be used to uh, prepare data for uh, deep learning, which is 80% uh, of, of work, right? And then um, you can use some of these to uh, actually train your deep learning network. So the choice, why are all these um, <coughs> uh, frameworks appearing uh, is kind of clear. Um, so about Intel's big DL library framework, uh, it's open sourced in uh, December 2016, almost a year ago, and uh, it uses Intel's uh, math kernel library for fast computations. You can, uh, it, it, it uh, happens seamlessly and uh, there's no uh, extra installation steps required for this. It's integrated into Spark, it uses, uh, as we'll see later, and uh, there, there's no GPU execution. They, they only provide um, Intel, uh, learning on Intel uh, CPUs. So you cannot use GPUs with Intel big deal yet. Uh, it's open source now, so maybe uh, the community might uh, um, uh, contribute to this. Uh, you have Python and Scala APIs, and you can uh, load and save Cafe, uh, TensorFlow, and Torch models. And there's really a wide variety of layers, uh, optimization methods, loads, functions, and, and, and so on. This is just from their website, um, uh, what they provide. It's really, uh, there's no time to go through all of these. I, I guess uh, all, all the components that you might need are there. Uh, so the architecture uh, is you have, uh, again, inside the Sparks uh, cluster, you have your driver and executors, and uh, BigDL uses a block, Sparks block manager for uh, as a distributed parameter server. So there's no single uh, parameter server. Uh, th there's no bottleneck. Driver is not acting as a bottleneck. And each of the executors runs as um, runs BigDL as a singleton. There's one instance of BigDL running inside of each um, executor, and each instance will train uh, several local models in parallel, and those, uh, it depends on the number of uh, cores that you give it, and all those uh, local models that will be in each iteration will be um, averaged, and then there will be all reduce operation on, on all, uh, thr through the block manager uh, to further reduce um, average parameters across all the nodes. And it uses um, tensors and tables, which are used inside BigDL. Um, automatically, uh, operations on them use um, that math kernel library. And um, what else to say? Yes, uh, you have to, when you're starting BigDL, it's um, important to, uh, to specify the uh, batch size. So <coughs> the input data is, um, uh, uh, um, You'll see later that uh, uh, BigDL takes the number of executors and number of cores, and then uses that to 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 spin up the uh, cluster, and then uh, the batch size that you provide to your with your data determines how how much uh, what uh, part of the data is processed in each iteration. You'll see later what I mean. Uh, so to start BigDL in local mode. Uh, you add big deal jar to the class path, of course, and then um, you need to um, set the local mode property. Uh, that's Java system property, big deal local mode true, and you tell it how many cores you want to give it, and then call this uh, special function engine init, which will then uh, calculate the number of uh, executors that you have and uh, how to uh, distribute the, the work. And this engine class, for example, is put, uh, this is one of the things I, I didn't like in BigDL. Uh, engine, for example, class is put into unit util uh, package. It's kind of, you have to use it to start uh, BigDL. I don't think it belongs there, but you know, it's minor detail that kind of bugged me. Um, to, st to start it on Spark, 
you again add it to uh, class path. You can use the jars option. And then uh, you set uh, command line parameters to uh, which uh, big DL will look at to determine the number of ex uh, cores and executors that you, that you have. On standalone and mesos, this is the way to do it, executor cores and total executor cores. And on yarn, you use executor cores and num executors. Those are important for big DL. And uh, in your code, you need to create the uh, Spark config uh, yourself, and then you create a Spark context using this config created by the Big Deals engine, and then uh, again call engine in it. So pretty simple. Um, okay. To create a model, you have two types of models: sequential models and graph ones. Uh, sequential models. Um, you just create uh, object of type sequential and then add layers one after the other. In graph models, you define inputs and outputs, and then in the end, you create a graph and specify which is the input, which is the output. If those aren't really connected, then uh, you will get an exception. And um, so uh, you, you just, each layer, you, you specify num all the inputs you wanted to have, and uh, Output from that layer can be <coughs> input to several, one of several other layers. So you really can have a graph-like structure similar to, to TensorFlow, which you cannot do with uh, the sequential model. And graph models, uh, only graph models can be saved as TensorFlow or CAFE models. The sequential ones cannot. And you cannot visualize graph models inside the TensorFlow Tensor board. Uh, the example data set is the uh, de dogs versus cats from Kaggle. There are 25,000 images in the, in the training set. I used uh, only 1,000 for training, testing, validation. Uh, so the example output, you, you would uh, get an image, and the model would say it's 73% dog or 20 and 27% cat. Uh, but you, you we don't need two values, right? Because uh, those have to add up to 200. So we need just one value. The, um, uh <laughs> again, that word, the uh, P, that it's a uh, dog, that's 73%, uh, 0.73. Um, uh, so the uh, example model uh, that, that I used is a sequential one. I also use the graph one. Um, <coughs> so it has a spatial convolution of three. Uh, in, uh, you have to specify number of input channels or input feature maps and the number of output feature maps. In this case, it's three input channels because there's RGB images. Then you have 32 output feature maps. And uh, you want to use a kernel three by three and stride of one. That's the this spatial convolution line. And the Xavier initialization is used for initializing weights. Uh, uh, the ReLU activation function, then spatial max pooling, which then uh, uh, reduces the size of the uh, of those uh, feature maps to by by the factor of two, because it uses stride of two and kernel of two. Um, and uh, those uh, layers repeat by uh, converting those 32 feature maps to 64, then to 128, and in the next step to uh, a one more convolution, 128 to 128. And uh, in the last <coughs> step, you uh, transform this tensor that has 20, 228 times 7 times 7 uh, elements, transform it to just one single vector, and uh, add, in this case, a dropout is added. Dropout will randomly pick several of those uh, units and set them to zero to, to add some kind of um, regularization so that uh, your model doesn't overfit to your data that easily. And um, then the uh, linear model, or otherwise known as fully connected or dense uh, layer, uh, so linear layer is added that outputs uh, 512 uh, vector of 512 elements, and then finally we get our outputs output of just one uh, value, and then sigmoid is applied to convert this value to a um, uh, value from zero to one. 
And uh, one thing I also uh, kind of found challenging is to to see to debug this model to see how many if if I put in an image of uh, that many pixels, uh, what is the output of each layer? Uh, it's not easy to see that with a uh, big DL. It could be easy, for example, to add a debugging function which would do just that. I, you tell it, um, you tell it, you give it the model and you give it the dimensions of the input uh, picture, and it outputs for each. A layer. What is the output size? Otherwise, we have to calculate and guess. In bigger models, it can it can get uh, cumbersome. Uh, so, to prepare the data, this is uh, the official example uh, that says uh, we can use the data set uh, class, big DLs class. Uh, that uh, if you call array, you provide it with a, a local data. If you call RDD, you pro you provide it with an RDD, Sparks RDD. And uh, once you have your data set, you can apply those uh, magic uh, transformations. Uh, those three last lines are uh, transformers in big DL. And there are several options for transformers. And uh, those magic uh, arrows um, are just a um, shortcut for actually uh, mapping each partition with, uh, with, the, with an instance of, of these um, uh, transformers. So uh, this is very nice. <coughs> but they're using here, for example, the load uh, function, which is actually private, private method, and it's in the official documentation, kind of um, embarrassing. Uh, so there, there are a couple of examples like this also. The, the documentation is not that good. So, and uh, uh, this is also a nice concept, but uh, there are some, uh, some uh, transformers that are missing for the tasks that you might need. So I, I rolled, rolled out my own um, method of loading data because I had, um, they suppose, big DL developers suppose, that's what they needed for their um, examples. They suppose that you have um, your data inside the sequence, uh, HDFS sequence file. And, um, but I, I had my data in, inside uh, separate images, inside the folder. Uh, these, these are the transformers, I don't think you can see them, but there are, a uh, bunch of those, but they don't cover all the things you might need. So um, uh, you can use uh, something like this, say uh, uh, binary files from the folder, this is Spark's uh, uh, method, to load files into a, uh, it, it would give you a name of the file and the binary content of the file. Then you can use um, uh, Java's image IO uh, library to read those bytes into a buffered image. And then you can use the big DLS BGR image to resize this image and uh, transfer it to um, byte record, uh, which is then understood by the labeled, uh, which can be um, um, uh, converted to a labeled BGR image. And when w in the second mapper here, when you specify copy and uh, then this 255, it will automatically um, uh, normalize the image by, di by dividing each pixel by 255. So the uh, values inside your tensors in labeled BGR image will all be between zero and one. And labeled BGR image also requires uh, a label. I mean, it doesn't really require a label, but you want it uh, in your training data, of course. So you provide the label. And um <coughs> this last, last mapper uh, maps partitions using the BGR image to sample takes a BGR image and creates a sample class which then uh, big deal knows how to deal with to train your model. And uh, this last mapper is actually what those um, shortcut transformers actually do when you use them. They just map partitions using uh, the objects of uh, transformer class. Go, next, no. Please, can someone change the slide, please? Okay, thanks. Uh, so then you need to create an optimizer, which will be used to uh, uh, to change the weights according to the loss value. Uh, you have to give it your module that we already uh, created. You give your training data, and you, you have to uh, give it a criterion, which will be used during the training process to, to see uh, how well the process is going. 
training process. <coughs> and then you, uh, it, it's important to uh, specify the batch size. So this, is, this has to be the multiple of all the executors or cores that you have in your cluster because um, as you've seen in the architecture, uh, the each uh, executor builds several models and all of them have to share the, num the weights and the, uh, the sizes and um, so uh, they have to be trained on the same amounts of data, let's say. So batch size determines how many of the samples from your training data will be uh, uh, considered in each, used in each iteration on each executor. So if you have 10 executors and you specify batch size of 10, then uh, in each iteration, each executor will uh, use only one sample for training. So you want this to be some relatively high number, but not that high that you uh, are run out of memory. Then you say how long you want the training to last using the trigger function. For example, mach maximum uh, number of epochs of 10. And uh, epoch is, by the way, the <coughs> uh, how uh, when you go through all of your data in one pass, that's an epoch. So you want 10 passes through all of your input data. And uh, you, you tell it what optimization method to use. Adam is one of the most often used uh, so it's also used here with learning rate of uh, 10 to minus 4. And um, uh, you can op optionally set validation methods so that uh, it will each, again, trigger. In this case, it's um, uh, several it 10 iterations. Each 10 iterations, it will validate your data on the validation set. So you have to, I mean, testing set. And uh, you can specify several criterions to, to calculate during the validation. There you have loss using the um, binary cross entropy and top one accuracy. And then also you have to specify the batch size. So the optimizer is kind of uh, important in big DL. Uh, next slide, please. And um, uh, you can optionally set up a tensor board visualization. So if you uh, provide train summary folder, validation summary folder um, to the optimizer, it will um, use uh, output uh, tra training and validation information to this folder, and it will use those um, prefixes. You want those to be unique to your training session. In this case, it's just train and set test, but you want to do use something unique. And then finally, just call optimize on the optimizer, and it will start, start running. And then uh, <coughs> you will see an output similar to this one, uh, the epoch two, iteration two, and so on. And every 10 iterations, you will see um, the, that, uh, the validation, um, that that's, um, uh, the criterions of your validation be calculated. So you have some loss and top accuracy um, calculated every 10, 10 iterations. And um, if you examine ten TensorBoard output, you can see accuracy uh, graph uh, depending on the number of iterations. We have some top one accuracy. And uh, uh, if you specified validation, you would see two graphs like this. Uh, the green graph is the, uh, um, the validation of your loss on your training set and the gray one is loss on your uh, testing set. So this is a, uh, <coughs> a typical example of uh, overfitting on the input data because the error on the training set keeps uh, uh, decreasing and the uh, testing set try, uh, starts to increase at some point uh, because you, your model is overtrained on, the, on the, those input data. So I had only 1,000 images, so that was likely to, to happen. So what can, do, what can you do is use data augmentation. That's one of the things you can do. And um, uh, it is common technique in uh <coughs> uh, visual pro uh, image processing where you uh, provide different images from, from your input images. You provide um, new images by randomly uh, creating a shear of the image, uh, moving the image around, uh, rotating, uh, zooming in and out, and so on, flipping horizontally. Uh, Big DL comes with some of the transformers that support this, but not all of these uh, functions. So I, I created again a function that will take an RDD and um, 
load an RDD from a folder on HDFS, and you can tell it uh, how to scale it, uh, what's the label of, the, of those images, whether to flip it or not, uh, whether to include the original image or not, and how, how many instances of rotated instances, sh sheared in instances, and so on to create. Um, so the next challenge is that um, Big DL says that you have to keep all the data in memory all the time, uh, the official documentation. And uh, <coughs> while that's true, because that's how Spark works, you have to keep the data in memory, there's a, a method that you can use to uh, actually uh, keep changing the RDDs you're training, containing your training data. By uh, every several epochs, you can uh, take your trained model and optimization method from that uh, uh, from your optimizer, save them for the, uh, save them and um, load the next RDD and then uh, start the optimization process using those trained m model and optimization method again. Th that can uh, help you to actually <coughs> have something like um, Keras data augmentation with, Keras has generators that keep uh, generating data all the time in, in a sort of streaming way. So this is something close to that. <coughs> so uh, the output approved after I, I did this. So uh, there's se 74 um, uh, accuracy, which is not that high, uh, but given the amount of data I had, it wasn't wasn't bad. And the you can see that the uh, uh, overfitting uh, is not happening anymore. It uh, goes down nicely. The uh, testing error goes down together with the uh, training error. So to use the model, you can save it. <coughs> if you just say, say save module, that's a big DL's uh, format, and you can then load it th in the same way. Uh, you can save it as cafe, if it's graph model in TensorFlow or Torch. Uh, recently, I think uh, they added uh, quantization similar to TensorFlow, so that actually um, only uh, tries to uh, reduce the floating point precision in order to uh, incre um <coughs> increase the performance and speed, but uh, with re somewhat reduced accuracy, which is not not that uh, that big problem. Um, and you can use uh, whether the original model or this quantized one to predict uh, values of validation set. And validation set here is just an RDD containing samples. And uh, you can then count, for example, a uh, uh, number of correctly predicted values yourself, like in, the, in this slide here. Uh, you have your uh, predictions will contain tensors. In, the in, in this case, it's just uh, tensors contain just one value because we outputted one value. Uh, otherwise, you, you could have some vectors or tensors, whatever. And then you can inspect those yourself, or you can uh, use, again, evaluate method and provide, the again, the criterions, uh, whichever you like, and that will give you some uh, values of those uh, metrics. Uh, you can also do transfer learning to freeze the model. Um, it's also not really clear right from the start from the documentation how to do this, but you can, uh, you have to use the model names to, uh, uh, layer names to freeze freeze uh, particular layers. You have to freeze them by a name, and it's not really clear how to get the name at first. So you can use something like this. Um, you have to first uh, cast the model to a container class, and then you have access to your layers inside. And uh, finally, uh, Spark Big DL uh, uh, offers Spark Machine ML uh, library integration, and Spark ML has uh, <coughs> several, three main um, um, interfaces for doing machine learning. That's estimator, transformer, and evaluator. Estimator is like a model that's uh, trained or optimizer. Here, uh, you c you then you have fit function that will optimize on input data and produce a model, which is then uh, also an, Im an implementation of a transformer. Then you use transformer to transform data uh, pr producing predictions. And then you have evaluators that uh, you can call evaluate on and uh, compare the input data from 
with the, the that uh, transform data. So Spark Big DL uh, provides uh, classes that uh, come uh, get into this um, uh, um, uh, API, Spark API, and that's. Um, um, Okay, sorry, you have to first <coughs> put your data inside a, a data frame. And basically, you have to have uh, a column with, um, uh, that contains a vector of uh, floats or doubles. Uh, by the way, I didn't say this. Uh, big deal supports floats, works with floats or doubles. So um, you can, floats are shorter, right? Uh, so um, uh, the data frame has to have uh, at least one uh, column with uh, all the features from your image, input image, as uh, an array of uh, floats, and the labels also similarly as an array of floats. Um, here I used uh, those um, shortcut <coughs> syntax that BigDL provides with the transformers for preparing the data. And um, uh, you, you also have to specify the criterion and this is the DL classifier is uh, one of the uh, estimator implementation. W w then you can use the fit method on it, providing your training set. And uh, there are two ways that you can provide those hyperparameters to estimators in Spark. Um, you can either do this directly like this, or you can uh, use the parameter map. And if you use parameter map, you can uh, <coughs> specify several versions of these hyperparameters, and then you can use Spark pipelines to automate um, cross-validation and uh, uh, training of several uh, uh, models, and then Spark will automatically uh, train all of those uh, different instances of models model based on the versions of hyperparameters that you pro provided, and pick the best one, and you can use uh, cross-validation by dividing the uh, data set automatically, and so on. So <coughs> that's, uh, that's nice to have. However, um, you, they don't provide currently access to the optimizer uh, object inside the estimator. Wh while you, so you cannot uh, specify the validation that you want, nor the visualiz visualization parameters for the summaries for the tensor board. So currently, uh, I, I have to say it's not that useful. But uh, it's not that difficult to fix either, I think. So I think it will be fixed soon. Uh, next slide, please. So in, in conclusion, um, it's an interesting and clever concept. I didn't say this, but uh, it's really good uh, piece of engineering. It's a, it has really solid foundations if you look at the uh, code and the way it was uh, done. It's really, and I haven't encountered uh, many uh, you know, errors or really, um, <coughs> I think it's good tested and uh, really solid foundations. And um, it's well optimized by using uh, uh, Matt Kernel library and also uh, the way it uses uh, threading and uh, block manager to uh, exchange parameters and uh, all reduce algorithms is uh, really clever. And uh, it has lots of layers, optimization methods, as, as I said, uh, I guess everything you might need. Um, okay, next please. Um, but it's missing the GPU support. There are some logical package classic naming choices that I uh, mentioned. Uh, on the da downside also, <coughs> API debug uh, is I think missing that you cannot really say which layer is uh, outputting uh, which dimensions and so on. Um, and those data convergence options could be improved, and uh, I think it will be. Um, it's nothing, uh, and the documentation could be better, but it's nothing that cannot be fixed except the GPU support, which is kind of a uh, <coughs> big uh, elephant in the room. Uh, but if it's uh, too exp expensive for you, for example, GPU, uh, using GPUs, you, you can consider a big deal. And, uh, <coughs> I haven't found uh, many benchmarks. I think um, uh, they say it's uh, a couple of orders of magnitude, uh, or one order of magnitude, uh, quicker than 
um, for example, a torch on a single machine, uh, something like that. But I wasn't able to find really benchmarks uh, with that information. So to to say uh, to repeat, I'm going to give away three books tomorrow at the at the lecture tomorrow, which will be about Spark tips and tricks, tick tick tips and tricks. And um, Manning provided uh, the discount code for 40% off of all of their books. You can use it as you like. So if there's time for questions, uh, I'm, I'm prepared to answer them. Questions, anyone? OK. Um, anyway, we are uh, publishing the slides and the videos as soon as we can after, after the event, so um, you will have access to, to this as well. Um, it's been very nice. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you for Cheers. having me. Thanks for listening.